Metroid Dread. Released in 2021, Metroid Dread is the latest game in the Metroid series. After over a decade of misses and misfires, Metroid fans finally got the critically acclaimed successor that they've been waiting for. A game that captures the spirit of the original, but with a modern take. The game's soundtrack, composed by Soshi Abe and Sayoko Doi, oozes with atmosphere with tracks that range from a sense of foreboding to downright terror as reprogrammed Emmys chase you down. Nearly 200 years before Metroid Dread, and well over a century before the first video game was ever made, Concert Etude No. 3, popularly known as Un Sospiro, was published by Franz Liszt. What Metroid Dread has in atmosphere, Un Sospiro has in aesthetic beauty. So what could a 170-year-old classical piece have in common with a dark video game soundtrack? You might be surprised at just how much. Melody and Line When I first started playing Metroid Dread, I was blown away by the atmosphere of the game's soundtrack, and I knew pretty much instantly that I wanted to do a video on it. Much to my surprise, I was pretty much the only person that felt this way. When I was researching for this video, I found countless posts about how the Metroid Dread soundtrack just wasn't very good. And most of them seemed to agree on why. There just weren't enough hummable melodies. For all that Metroid Dread got right, the comments seemed to go, how could they get the soundtrack so wrong? But this struck me as really odd. Were catchy tunes really what the Metroid Dread soundtrack aimed to do? If we go back to when the original Metroid game was released in 1986, game music was emerging as a brand new art form. Melody quickly became the focal point of game music, and catchy tunes dominated the game music landscape. Perhaps Franz Liszt would have felt right at home with this trend, more on that later, but the composer for the original Metroid, Hirokazu Tanaka, was not. Sound designers and mini studios started to compete with each other by creating upbeat melodies for game music. The pop-like, lilting tunes were everywhere. I wasn't happy with the trend because those melodies weren't necessarily matched with the tastes and atmospheres that the games originally had. The sound design for Metroid was therefore intended to be an antithesis for that trend. So that's interesting. Tanaka was against using melodies in the original Metroid game because he felt they were incompatible with its atmosphere. Which makes sense, right? Everyone enjoys a good melody, but would it make sense if the Dead Space soundtrack was just a bunch of catchy tunes? What about the Psycho soundtrack? Probably not. The role of music in games, just like in film or in theater, is to reinforce the setting and to bring it to life. And the setting in Metroid is all about, well, dread. In fact, Tanaka wanted to push the envelope even further, beyond just a lack of melody. I had a concept that the music for Metroid should be created not as game music, but as music the players feel as if they were encountering a living creature. I wanted to create the sound without any distinctions between music and sound effects. That's a pretty fascinating idea. Tanaka wanted the music to be so interwoven into the game's audio that you couldn't distinguish sound effects from music. Clearly, Tanaka accomplished his goal. There's no catchy tune, and the only melody, if you can even call it that, is a musical line that jumps large, dissonant intervals without any sort of implied harmony beneath it. If I were to play this track without any context, you would probably just think it's an audio capture from an old NES game rather than identifying it specifically as a piece of music. Just as Tanaka intended, the line was blurred between sound effects and music. Although the Metroid Dread soundtrack was scored by different composers, you can hear the spirit of the original game in its music. There are no humble melodies to be found, and many tracks take this same approach of blending sound effects and music. For example, check out the Emmy Chase track that plays when an Emmy discovers the player and begins hunting them down. Uh. 
or the central unit battle track. With the sole exception of the pulsating synth, just about every other element in these tracks could be a sound effect in the game. In fact, I'm not even sure how I would go about transcribing these tracks because really what makes them tick is the sound effects rather than some chord or melody. There's really just something that gets lost in translation trying to put tracks like these into sheet music form. Of course, that doesn't mean that Metroid Dread doesn't use line at all. Even though line and melody are often used interchangeably, Tanaka refers to melodies as something that someone can sing or hum. Even though Metroid Dread doesn't use any melodies as far as Tanaka's definition goes, it's chock full of musical line. It's just that, like in the original Metroid, those lines are very angular and jump large dissonant intervals. Not only is it difficult to write a compelling score without any hummable melodies at all, it's surely made even more difficult when you know that that's not what fans want. Gamers want catchy tunes. But for Abe and Doi, having a soundtrack that honored the original Metroid was far more important. Let's compare these lines to the main melody in Un Suspiro. Suspiro's melody is a beautiful pentatonic line that's something you could easily walk around humming for the rest of the day. This comes as no surprise because Liszt was a composer of the Romantic era, which placed a great deal of emphasis on music's ability to move us emotionally. In other words, Liszt wanted that tune to be as beautiful as possible. So where am I going with all this? Both Metroid Dread and Un Suspiro use musical line, but to opposite ends. Metroid Dread uses line to create a sense of unease, whereas Un Suspiro uses line to create a pleasing aesthetic. And that's what this video is about. It's about how you can use the same compositional techniques, but in radically different ways and with radically different results. Tension and release. Another part of what makes these two pieces of music so compelling is their use of tension and release. This is a very common technique in composition but what makes comparing these two pieces so interesting is that they use a lot of the same techniques to accomplish creating tension. The three techniques that I want to focus on in this video are dissonance, chromaticism, and rhythmic intensity. I've already mentioned how the lines in Metroid Dread are dissonant, but really the entire soundtrack is full of dissonance, whether it's a line or harmony. You can see how the dissonant harmony in these tracks adds to the pervasive sense of unease in the Metroid Dread soundtrack. They may not be super catchy and stick in your head, but it fits perfectly within the context of the Metroid universe. In Un Suspiro, Liszt does something very similar. Check out this F major section.
Let's take a closer look. The rapid arpeggios keep the music driving with a sense of forward momentum. The piece then starts to darken by using dissonant, closely voiced chords in the left hand. Both of that continues as the music quickly transitions from F major to C sharp minor and then lands on a B flat diminished chord. This rapid change of harmony begins to make it ambiguous which key we're actually in. The music feels unsettled, adding to the already substantial tension. It feels like the section is building to something, which brings me to my next point. Both Metroid Dread and Un Suspiro make use of chromaticism. Chromaticism is simply using the notes of the chromatic scale interspersed with notes of the diatonic scale of whatever key you're in. It sounds a lot more difficult than it actually is, so let me show you what I mean. Check out this string figure from the Kraid boss fight in Metroid Dread. If we simplify the notes down to those that fall on accented beats, we see the pattern just alternates between F sharp and D sharp. If we consider the piece to be an F sharp minor, these would be our diatonic notes, or notes that fall within the key. If we go back to the original figure, we can see that the composer simply connected these two notes by half step, or chromatically. This is a basic example, but this is the general idea of chromaticism. When combined with very rapid rhythms, chromaticism can achieve a very similar effect to Liszt's rapid changing of key. It blurs any sense of key that we may have. Creating harmonic ambiguity in this way is another way of creating tension. If we go back to that same section of Un Suspiro, I mentioned that it felt like it was building to something. Well, this is what it was building to, a chromatic run in six with blazing fast rhythm. This fast chromatic run washes away any sense of key. Liszt uses this technique a second time later in the piece, except this time he gives us the release we've been waiting for in a return to the main melody. It's a pretty great payoff, right? The melody seems even more beautiful than before because of the musical tension that was created. It's almost like we've gained some sort of wisdom along the way. But just like with Un Suspiro, Metroid Dread also uses chromaticism with rapid rhythms to create tension. In the last gameplay sequence of Metroid Dread, after you've beaten the game's final boss, you have about three minutes to get out of dodge before the entire facility collapses on top of you. The gameplay intensity is ramped up to 11, and the music matches the moment. Check it out. Damn, that is spicy. Let's take a closer look. Coming in hot at 268 beats per minute, the core of the track is an ostinato that blazes past at a fiery rate. Is that enough heat puns for you? This ostinato is a repeating eight bar phrase, and surprise, surprise, it's very chromatic and harmonically ambiguous. 
The closest thing we can identify as a key is the A natural that is heard again and again on beat one. This implies some sense of arrival to that A natural. The thing is, that's not enough to tell us what the key is. It's impossible to say whether we're in A minor, A major, or some other mode that begins on A. There are about as many C sharps as there are C naturals. Plus, the notes in between each repeat of the A natural don't make it any easier for us. They come in sets of two, three, or four notes that either descend or ascend by half step. Just like with Liszt, it's hard to detect any sense of key. Once the set completes, the ostinato continues to drive forward just like the arpeggios in Un Suspiro. But Abe and Doi also release tension in the same way that Liszt did. In fact, we can better understand how they wanted to accomplish that by going back to Tanaka's original Metroid soundtrack. The melody in Metroid is only used at the ending after you killed the mother brain. That's because I wanted only a winner to have a catharsis at the maximum level. For that reason, I decided that melodies would be eliminated during gameplay. Pretty amazing idea, right? Tanaka wanted you to get through the entire game before finally releasing the tension at the very end. It's a pretty brilliant use of form. Abe and Doi preserved this spirit once again in the Metroid Dread soundtrack. With incredible restraint, after nearly six hours of gameplay, you finally get your release at the end of the game. Only when the credits roll do you get your catharsis in the form of a melody. Given how totally different Metroid Dread and Un Suspiro are, it's pretty incredible that they not only share the same goal of tension and release, but they accomplish it in a lot of the same ways. The end result sounds so radically different, it just goes to show the spectrum of possibility available to us composers. But perhaps what I love the most about Metroid Dread and Un Suspiro is that every aspect of the composition serves a purpose. Every note, every rhythm, even the form itself serves a purpose. This is what I strive to do in my music as well, whether for games or not. I want every detail and every aspect of the composition to serve the vision of the piece. And when that's done well, in my mind, that's what makes great music. Despite the incredible gulf between Metroid Dread and Un Suspiro in sound and age and artistic intent, both of these compositions do exactly that, and that's why they're worth talking about. Thanks for watching, everyone. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos like this in the future, and I'll see you next time.